Well, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of, uh, of a feminist conference organized by um, Collective Struzhani and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Um, I'm really happy to welcome here today with me uh, Esther Kovac, uh, who's a researcher and PhD candidate from, well, from, from Budapest, but now he's talking to, to us from Berlin. Uh, I'm especially happy uh, to, <laughs> to, to, to finally meet her, at least, at least on Zoom. Uh, I, I've been uh, searching for her work for quite some time, uh, and actually uh, Esther is one of the first scholars, uh, even cited by Wikipedia, who coined the, the term anti-gender or anti-gender movement. <laughs> and uh, well, she will be talking to us today about the possibilities, but maybe more about the, the limits uh, and challenges of the intersectional approach in assessing the situation of the of, of women in, uh, in East Central Europe um, in, within the European Union. So Esther, welcome. It's really lovely to, <clears throat> to have you here with us. Um, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you very much. Thank you for these kind words. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I'm so glad to be here while I, at the same time, I'm so uh, frustrated. I was so much looking forward to this event in uh, person. I'm a big, um, fan of uh, East Central European women's uh, networking and uh, I'm fed up with uh, Zoom as everybody else, um, I suppose, but um, hopefully in several months we can uh, catch up uh, live and um, we can do it that way. Um, I prepared a PowerPoint presentation. I'm trying to uh, uh, share it with you. Can you see me and see it? Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, oops, yeah. So um, I will talk about the intersecting reach, regional and gender equalities uh, within the uh, EU. Um, and what I am going to say will be based on several writings I tried to uh, compile here. Part of them I wrote uh, along uh, part of them I wrote in um, co-authorship with uh, Elena Zaharenko, for instance, on the EU gender equality strategy and how it fails in Central European women uh, with a Hungarian scholar in Hungarian in a longer um, um, scientific article and in an English polemic article about uh, intersectionality you can find on the internet or um, in, a, in the Slovak uh, magazine, uh, Capital, what went right is also what went wrong, which is also about this topic. I think it was published in Slovak and English uh, too, um, or, or, or in German about the individual turn uh, within uh, intersectionality. So uh, I'm now basing my talk on, uh, on these uh, papers, but as I said, some of them are not my thoughts alone. Um, uh, First, I would like to start with some examples how intersectionality is uh, framed uh, um, within the EU, in the UN, and what are the challenges. Uh, I will then try to uh, see what are the what 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 makes sense out of it, and what uh, um, what are the, in my view, uh, problematic uh, developments also from East Central European point of view to then expand on the East Central European part. Um, so uh, the European Union's gender equality strategy, so the commission strategy was uh, presented last March in the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and it uh, defines intersectionality as an analytical tool for studying, understanding and responding to the ways in which sex and gender intersect with other personal characteristics, identities, and how these intersections contribute to unique experiences of discrimination. Uh, as an example, they uh, bring up that a migrant woman with a disability may face discrimination on three or more grounds. Uh, so we can see that the intersectionality is understood in a, 
terms of discrimination and the multiple discriminations understood not as structures uh, of oppression, but personal characteristics and identities um, and has an additive approach. So with this example, migrant woman, migrant plus woman plus disability equals three oppressions. Uh, so this uh, additive um, approach is pursued. Um, to quote a recent example, which was from um, February uh, on, the, on the Valentine's Day from UN Women and to bring in also the role of social media in how these debates about intersectionality are uh, so polarized. Um, UN Women uh, tried to commemorate uh, Valentine's Day with a, ve with a very intersectional uh, graphic on uh, different forms and combinations of love where they tried to include different sexualities, skin colors, um, uh, cis, trans, um, everything. And in, in my interpretation, they included a person alone in order not to suggest couple normativity uh, so, that, uh, they, they, that, so that the people who are alone do not feel <laughs> discriminated against. And this um, gesture backfired against them uh, because they got a very huge um, uh, storm on uh, on Twitter how racist uh, they are because it is exactly the black woman who is alone uh, and who and so basically uh, um, they the next day they retrieved the photo and uh, used a very schematic uh, one which doesn't offend anyone but basically it is very difficult to put all different categories and all considerations uh, in it if uh, it is really um, difficult not to uh, offend anyone. And I, I think it has a lot to do with how uh, intersectionality as a formerly useful concept has developed into this uh, individualized um, and uh, policy to policing tool where it is very uh, difficult not to uh, offend uh, somebody. I'm not I'm sure I don't need to expand on this. Uh, everybody is uh, aware, but I just uh, uh, wrap up very briefly what intersectionality used to be and how it uh, started. Uh, so way before the term was coined in the 70s in the US, um, uh, black lesbian feminists organized against uh, one dimensional struggles and one dimensionality in social movements. Uh, so they criticized the uh, white focus of the fem white middle class focus of the feminist movements who saw their own um, struggles and issues as uh, the universal woman's issue, whereas in the anti uh, racist struggles, the men dominated women and also uh, their issues didn't find the resonance within those movements. So this was a basically a critical intervention to correct um, blind spots uh, of one-dimensional movements. Uh, while in the end of the 80s, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, a lawyer, coined the term intersectionality itself and tried to address the, the blind spots in anti-discrimination law to make visible the specific discriminations that black women face, uh, which are not grasped by sexism or racism only. Uh, also, this was born in the US context. Uh, I think we need to bear it in mind in Europe and especially in East Central Europe, uh, that the US context is uh, much more individualistic. And even if we are complaining about the lacks of our welfare states, uh, it's still uh, way more than uh, US has ever had. Um, so in that context, uh, uh, anti-discrimination has a much more, much bigger value and a, a, a much more corrective uh, function. Uh, whereas in our context, it might be a step backwards if we are, uh, uh, concentrating only on uh, on equal rights and equal treatment, what anti-discrimination uh, is about. Uh, and also in the US context, racism has a very specific history, um, which is um, about the slavery. And also within that context, there are a lot of critical scholars who uh, formulate 
things like a quote, one quote of what I put there that uh, in the uh, current anti-racist activism, the, the entire history of uh, white violence is reduced to an effect of a purported white enjoyment of black suffering, as though the chief business of slavery were the production of white supremacy rather than the production of cotton, sugar, rice, and tobacco. So also these critical scholars try to draw the attention to the uh, economic origins of, uh, uh, of racism uh, and how it served to subjugate people to, uh, to, to give an ideology why it's um, okay to uh, exploit them. But even then it is a, again, some, it is a very uh, specific US um, um, experience which uh, the, the ra racism in uh, East Central Europe uh, has a, very different uh, contextual historical roots and also target groups. If we think about the Roma, for instance, for Hungary, Slovakia and Czech Republic, or the now the uh, migration uh, crisis. So it's uh, basically what I plead for is that we need a more contextualized um, historical um, analysis. But so there is uh, this, there are these um, uh, roots and histories of intersectionality um, whereas today um, we find things like this, uh, both are uh, um, graphs from the Center for Intersectional Justice, um, um, that, uh, an organization that has a seat in Berlin, uh, which uh, the, on, the right, on the right, so the, the person in a, a, a wheelchair, it's from a PowerPoint presentation at the European Parliament where the organization lobbied for more intersectionality in the European gender equality strategy. On the left, it, they posted it one or two weeks ago to, to plea for how great the concept of intersectionality is. What we can see is uh, are plenty of things, uh, what this idea, um, and of course, I, I'm sure you know plenty of other illustrations that try to capture the complexity of intersectionality, whereas in my view, it shows how simplistic and additive uh, uh, it has become, uh, like um, having an Excel sheet um, and uh, in every dimension and which are on the equal level and you, there is a, um, a dominant and a dominated position. And then there is, the list is endless, uh, like they write it after point 12 that and many more so that nobody feels uh, excluded. Uh, class is just one dimension, which is this, at the same level with body size. Uh, and uh, sex is, has disappeared or sex and gender identity are understood together. So basically women and trans and non-binary are one category, if I understand this um, correctly. Um, so basically, um, it seems that uh, the origins of the discourse uh, that it's from comes from the law uh, and comes from the US, which is more individualistic, that uh, the uh, intersectionality is uh, very much uh, fixed on discrimination or they understand structural inequality in terms of discrimination. And if we are in discrimination, then it, it, uh, it means it's uh, um, individual behaviors of employers towards uh, employees, which is very fine and we need all, um, uh, we, we, I, I'm not questioning the existence of such authorities where we can turn to if we are not equally treated, uh, but it shouldn't stop there. Uh, whereas very often it stops there and it uh, leads to, and it lends itself very much into this uh, positionality wars um, on when it's about uh, representations who, uh, of who can speak, who can speak for whom, uh, and uh, being um, affected means not only that a plea for being heard, but that also be plea for being right and claiming that whoever feels offended or uh, um, affected by a thing, then uh, it um, then that person uh, is right. Um, also, this is a very static and ahistorical uh, approach. Uh, so basically, we cannot account for changes, including positive changes. So if you, you are on the losing position, then you will always be in the losing position, uh, which doesn't help us to account for 
um, the bettering of situation of women or of certain group of migrants who are uh, very well received in uh, their uh, um, new um, environments or societies. So, uh, and it is also treated very ahistorically and um, geographically uh, um, blindly, basically. So in certain cultures, age is a source of um, uh, respect whereas in other countries, it's a source of uh, uh, disrespect or uh, decay. So there, this is not uh, um, universal and it uh, presents itself uh, as such. Uh, and also what uh, the three basic categories, uh, when the basic categories race, class, gender are concerns, um, then these were cut, used to be categories which described realities that the left used to want to get rid of, namely uh, that we shouldn't be, live in a class society. We shouldn't have uh, social consequences out of the fact that we are born in sexed bodies. So basically we wanted to get rid of gender. We wanted to get rid of the gender consequences and that the, the society imposes on us. Uh, whereas now it has become a list of um, identities and everybody can make his or her own um, uh, unique mix of uh, discriminations. Um, and uh, from East Central European point of view or European point of view, um, another problem is, um, is this decontextualization uh, problem. So the right wing picture, this is a photo I took at the Hamburg University in Berlin. Uh, and I also uh, hear that uh, the, any German word, what they have in German to address black people, so black or colored or any others, there is, this, they are not politically correct. Only using the English term POC, people of color, is considered um, uh, correct, which is a problem if uh, anything, any tries to put it into their own language is uh, not considered. Um, um, Good and on the left uh, there is a photo from a um, Hungarian. Um, it's from Budapest. Uh, that the students from the Central European University four four years ago on w International Women's Day organized a march for Women's Day. And in the beginning they try you know they are foreign students and in the beginning they tried to engage with Hungarian feminists, uh, but they didn't agree on the claims. And instead of uh, uh, coming to some compromise on the sex work prostitution issue. So the, in Hungary, uh, um, out of many reasons, but the biggest part of the feminist movement is uh, abolitionist. So uh, they couldn't agree on, on that position, or at least that they leave out uh, the sex worker claim. Uh, the Hungarians were not present. So basically, there was a completely English language demonstration in Budapest, and they uh, carried many uh, uh, banners, uh, among others. This one, which is uh, very um, funny from Hungarian point of view, for instance, the hashtag indigenous women's lives matter, uh, which in the Hungarian context uh, is a racist slur, uh, whereas in the US we know that it refers to the um, to the indigenous Americans uh, in Hungary, it refers to uh, those who are non-Roma, so who, who claim to be have been here earlier. Uh, so it's uh, um, again uh, my uh, my idea is that uh, the, we should uh, be more careful or see what uh, how what and how uh, we take over and how, what kind of adoption work or reflection work we need to. Uh, use concepts that were born and uh, claims that are used in um, other uh, contexts. Um, just two br uh, brief examples uh, to because there are basically the basic concepts of intersectionality are also reframed in the newer intersectionality trends. Uh, I, I illustrated very briefly with gender and with class. Um, whereas, for instance, the Istanbul Convention or the European Commission's new gender equality strategy defines gender as the socially constructed roles, behaviors, activities, and attributes that a given society considers appropriate for women and men. Uh, more and more EU documents um, frame it in the same way as um, uh, LGBT 
materials uh, frame it that it's the felt sense of identity. So there is the sex that is the thing you were assigned at birth, and then there is gender, which is your felt sense of identity. Um, it is a completely different view as taking sex for granted and uh, uh, you, um, treating gender as a, as a set of roles and a set of constraints imposed on uh, women and men. Uh, the same development is also when we talk about gender-based violence. So while the uh, um, Istanbul Convention and related documents uh, treat it as a violence that is directed against a woman because she's a woman or that affects women disproportionately. Uh, and basically, the, all the convention has this view of the, the, the violence against women is based in patriarchal structures, so the dominance, uh, the idea of dominance uh, of men over women. Um, more and more documents and call for uh, um, calls uh, of the European Commission, um, um, they define it in a way that uh, violence directed against a person because of that person's gender, gender identity, gender expression. Again, I'm not saying that uh, trans and non-binary people should not be uh, uh, saved from violence, but that the, the focus is away from the origin of violence towards the person uh, who, is affected, who is affected. So in the same way with the, uh, with the intersectional approach of the, the uh, European Union's um, gender equality strategy that we are not talking about uh, the the structural injustices, but it's about identities and characteristics. And then there is this photo I put there, I, I took this one at Hamburg University too. Uh, so this basically very subjectivistic, monologistic uh, and anti-scientific uh, and anti-intellectual view that me and only me uh, is uh, possible or can uh, give an account uh, of uh, of my own gender, whereas uh, um, social sciences and gender studies have been busy for decades to, to, to grasp the inequalities and the, in where they reside and how they come about and how they are reproduced. And the, uh, many questions are now basically said not to ask because I know it. And for me, this is how it is. Um, with class, we are um, um, observing similar tendencies. Um, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, the, the, the fact how class analysis has become just one of the many uh, intersectional dimensions. Uh, in the beginning, I said that I think it was a very important corrective in the 70s, 80s, that uh, women or gays or blacks or uh, were not, uh, um, were treated as uh, uh, the, uh, the neben Widerspruch, so the, the, the second, uh, uh, the, not, not, the, not the main contra contradiction, sorry, but the, the second one, I don't know the English word, um, in Marxian terms, that if we get rid of capitalism, then um, uh, patriarchy and um, oppression of gays and everything else will disappear. And there was this important critique that uh, we need to, that the worker is not only white and not only uh, male, but that women uh, have a, a say there and women have different uh, issues. Uh, while at the same time now, it has become just, just another category. And in all these um, diversity trainings held at uh, uh, companies and uh, um, um, the, the basically a sort of in an intersectional mix, the critic of capitalism and uh, uh, has been um, watered down or diluted uh, from the struggles and it is uh, very well um, illustrated in the uh, new term or now very fashionable term of classism where uh, which is the discrimination based on someone's socioeconomic status or assumed socioeconomic status basically somebody who looks like a worker and uh, uh, gets offended or if we are um, uh, mocking about the music taste of lower class people that would be classism uh, but uh, 
and of course we shouldn't do that, uh, but uh, it, it also um, reifies those uh, class identities as if those people who are poor wanted to be recognized as poor people and not get rid of their poverty. Uh, so uh, again, it's um, uh, there are these individualizing and uh, anti-structural um, developments in my view and in of the view of many. And how all that relates to East Central Europe, um, um, one is uh, what I wanted to bring in, yeah, first of all, the economic dimension, which is very much uh, lacking uh, in these intersectional uh, debates or, or what I can see of them. Here I put a, a graph from Thomas Piketty um, on the left. Um, but uh, surely the COVID pandemic has exposed uh, a lot of things that we, what we have known, but it has now become visible also to people who, who were not looking at it so carefully. Um, uh, surely you remember last year in the first wave where when the borders closed for the first time, what, um, how desperate uh, in Italy, in Great Britain or in Germany, uh, many branches have become uh, and, uh, and concluded bilateral um, contracts to ensure that the meat industry is functioning, the agriculture is functioning. So basically, the um, um, the the, in, the Eastern European workers from uh, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary were very very crucial uh, to be able to uh, harvest the the asparagus for the Germans or uh, um, it, an end, these people were not, didn't get the, um, all the protection. Uh, in Germany, there was a huge uh, scandal last May when in Tunis, in, the, in a very big meat industry, 1,500 um, Eastern Europeans uh, got infected with COVID because there were no hygiene. Uh, uh, measures there. So basically one thing is that Eastern European workers were essential for the running of this industry and second that their workers' rights and their safety were not uh, ensured. Uh, and um, I will come back to care migration separately again, which is a, a very big issue. Only in Germany, four, five hundred thousand of uh, Eastern European women care for um, elderly people in their homes. Um, but of course, it didn't start with COVID. Um, it goes back at least to the, uh, to the transformation processes. So basically, in uh, all Visegrad four countries, I'm uh, talking mainly about uh, this part of the region, um, the huge state debts, the, the lack of domestic capital, and the wish to join Europe again and Perspectively, prospectively joining the European Union, uh, um, it meant a huge economic um, exposure and the foreign direct investment dependency that has been documented by various economists. I'm not an economist, but I can recommend uh, uh, Jan Drahokopil, he's from the Czech Republic, or Bela Grechkovic, Dorothy Bule, who described also in the in comparative perspective how the, all this played out. So obviously, it was not a one dimensional. Thing. But, and what Piketty's uh, graph shows is uh, basically a refutation of the argument that in Eastern Europe people should be uh, glad and shut up because they get so much money from the EU and uh, from the West. Uh, and he showed, like many others, that uh, if we compare it with all, all the profits and other property incomes, uh, then the, the picture is a bit more uh, differentiated. So it was not uh, out of goodwill for Western Europe or for the EU that uh, Eastern Europe receives money for, uh, but that it was uh, markets and cheap labor. Um, and uh, they get plenty of subventions uh, um, continuingly and there is this race to the bottom. So when the Slovakia and Hungary are, uh, are competing where the German um, um, a certain German uh, company will have the next plant. Uh, so basically with the tax deductions or uh, subventions. 
Um, and very often these economic dependencies are presented as, uh, um, oops, sorry, as uh, civilizational shortcomings. So as if it were not rooted in the uneven developments, which uneven developments were historically and economically determined. It is presented as if we are still too corrupt, not efficient enough, not working hard enough. Um, Joseph Börötz or Attila Meleg thought uh, a lot about it, but uh, many others. And just one last example, which is um, a very uh, painful uh, for me always, because we've been living in Hungary for 11 years in a growingly authoritarian uh, regime, and um, the EU presents itself as a very uh, incapable actor. Uh, to address uh, that situation within the EU, it has it would be a completely new talk, so I will not go into the details. But uh, uh, one part of it is that uh, the German car industry uh, or ger then the German industry in itself uh, gets a lot of subvention from this uh, from the Hungarian uh, state and. Uh, Audi get, got four times more state subventions in Hungary uh, per uh, employee than in Germany. Uh, so it is a very, it's a very nice win-win situation for a German business uh, to be in Orbán's uh, Hungary. And it can, uh, as investigative journalists um, and scholars uh, figured out how this plays out also in political decisions in the European Parliament, in the European People's Party, and elsewhere. So it's um, our uh, Orban is of course homegrown, but uh, the EU is uh, um, sustaining uh, and legitimizing uh, that regime also through the way of uh, capital. And how that uh, how gender comes in. Um, is um, and here I come basically to the, uh, the intersectionality part, intersections of gender inequalities and east-west inequalities. Um, here on the right, I put uh, just one book title, um, um, an edited volume of uh, two Hungarian scholars about the care migration it was published several months ago. You can find it online, uh, which is one of the, uh, I think, and the issues which we talked uh, too little uh, about, so how, how women are treated uh, in Western Europe from uh, those who come from, uh, from Eastern Europe. Um, but uh, back to the, to the general parts, so the gender equality strategy of the European Commission, uh, when it speaks about gender equality, it says it's an essential condition for an innovative, competitive, and thriving European economy, which brings more jobs and higher productivity. Uh, so basically, this very uh, economic approach, economic case for gender equality. We need gender equality because it boosts the GDP. Uh, and in this sense, gender equality is defined in labor market uh, participation of women. So care is seen as a burden to labor market participation and efficiency. Um, and um, uh, the focus of the strategy is uh, on stereotypes and women should be encouraged to go into the STEM sector, but nothing about labor conditions, nothing about uh, um, uh, acknowledging the care professions or the um, um, European minimum wage or whatever, which would be uh, helpful for women and only about awareness raising and men should uh, take up more care jobs uh, and so on. Um, and as we know, uh, you know, care work is a very huge amount of time and, uh, and, uh, and in, in all, not only in Eastern Europe, but also in Western Europe, there is a huge care crisis. Uh, so the the the, um, the contradiction, the contradictory nature of capital accumulation and how uh, how life is reproduced uh, from day to day and from generation to generation, that the capital needs that uh, resource but uh, outsources it, and uh, everybody should solve it uh, uh, individually. And in those countries where 
families still have some resources or and, and in those countries the richer people um, can uh, outsource it to uh, lower class women of their own countries or from uh, women from southern and eastern Europe or the Philippines. Um, and this is a process what uh, the Czech sociologist Susanna Ude calls distorted emancipation. So basically the emancipation of certain women, emancipation meaning being able to do paid work and have economic independence or having more free time uh, is not due to male, more male involvement, uh, but also is based on these global inequalities uh, and that uh, they are uh, getting this emancipation on the backs of other women. That's why she calls it uh, distorted. Or Silvia Federici um, call, talks about it, about the madam made uh, relations uh, being among women, but both she or the, uh, or the Swiss uh, theoretician Tofel Zoyland uh, alert us not to individualize this problem. So it's not about uh, telling those uh, women in the West that they should uh, do the cleaning, they should care for the children because uh, that would mean that it's only an in attitude, attitude issue. If you are a good person, then you can do it alone. And only if you are a, a class blind, then you do it to others. Whereas we know that it's a very huge work and that it, it shouldn't be treated on this uh, uh, individualized and individual level. Um, but we should address the, the conditions of capitalism of European Union inequalities uh, to be able to address uh, the issue of care migration, the issue of um, the care crisis, the scarcity of care and uh, what we do about it. And in this particular topic, the East-West relation is very, very uh, strong. Uh, and um, the same East-West dependencies, so I just made it now, uh, I tried to make it clear on the example of care, but the same East-West dependencies and inequalities are present also within gender studies, within gender policy, and in feminist and LGBT activism too. Uh, so gender studies meaning uh, uh, in the sense of the dominance of the social science powers, as the Malaysian sociologist uh, Farid Alatas uh, put it. So the, the US, Great Britain, France, and what are the terms, what are the research agendas, who has the money, uh, who gets published, uh, so zero to two percent uh, of Eastern European uh, scholars uh, figure in gender studies journals as Veronika Wörer uh, found out, for instance. So it's very difficult um, to be as, a, on a, as an equal scholar if you are an uh, Eastern European. Uh, including not only so and and uh, very often the theory comes from from the west the data com come from the east so eastern european scholars are involved to put the case study from their uh, respective countries uh, to the already ready made uh, framework of the scholars in the gender policy i don't need to talk long about uh, the eu accession and of course joining the club was an asymmetrical process and uh, um, how gender equality is understood was under the way how the European Union understood back then. And that was taken over, which was in many ways a progress, but in many ways uh, also blind to equality, uh, to uh, realities uh, on the ground and uh, to feminist uh, struggles that, hey, we would like to have a say, but that was uh, much less uh, possible. And also it was a, um, double-edged sword, uh, in, I'm not sure if Veronika uh, Valkovic or somebody else wrote about it, how the, the European identity and the gender equality were tied together. Uh, and when, uh, when gender equality is losing the appeal, then the European identity is losing appeal and the vice versa. So it was, uh, it, it seemed to be even the EU had a very strong legitimacy it in, in enhanced the legitimacy of gender equality. But when after the 2008-9 crisis and the austerity and many other issues, uh, the EU lost it. So the, then the imposition of gender equality, so-called imposition was also uh, 
understood as a as a foreign import and this is what the right wing is um, using very strongly in Poland and Hungary for instance um, and again the yeah, the financial dependency of the so-called and uh, fetishized civil society of uh, of the eastern european countries so the basically the donor dependency and the uh, in, in in lack of state fund and in lack of uh, um, um, financial resources on the ground, this was very much so basically also the issues, the language, the goals of feminist and LGBT activism were very much shaped by by the donors and by the Western cooperation partners. Uh, what I'm saying with this is not, I don't want to say that the West is bad and we are oppressed, but at least to have a... Um, um, more reflect more reflections on these uh, embeddedness and that uh, that makes possible that we critically engage and not in, not fall into this trap of uh, west is good east is bad or we are backward and we need to catch up um so uh, my last uh, slide uh after i uh, exposed why i where i see the limits uh, of the intersectionality and especially in the current uh, usages of uh, intersectionality i think um, it can and it, it obviously it has a um, merit in terms of how to see things more complex in a more complex way uh, first of all i think it's um, as as, as nah, it still is a heuris good heuristic device for self reflection uh, what am I not seeing? Do I have interest in not seeing those things? So basically um, uh, asking the other question, uh, as uh, Matsuda said, that uh, to, to, to see that what I see as a, an injustice, as a problem, to ask it, is it uh, the same way? And what I see as a woman's problem, would uh, all women see it? in my surroundings or the who are below, below beyond my surroundings or or am i having certain uh, bias uh, but it also helps to avoid the seducing victimhood trap i mean it has a huge currency in the debates in this excel sheet understanding of intersectionality and especially in the competition for resources and fundings to prove who is more oppressed <laughs> and um, it's good to uh, to work uh, against it, uh, that not, not to search for so eagerly on in which dimension am I a victim, uh, while at the same time, of course, we need to address the inequalities. Uh, and um, as much as I can judge, this uh, approach is uh, the dominant Western feminist discourse. So um, I think that uh, very I, I met many Western feminists and scholars who, through the post-colonial or through the is, uh, intersectionalist lens or way, uh, if uh, if problems are addressed in this language, then they became more um, uh, more ready to listen to East Central Europe's position. Like, oh, sh you are right. We left out uh, Eastern Europe from from our global map. Um, uh, but then I think then there is a possibility to move away from the cultural issue and the civilizational issues and talk about the economic interests of those countries in the inequalities and uh, in the um, taking uh, like the Polish, uh, Polish putzfrau, the, the Polish cleaner uh, for uh, granted. Uh, so basically, how uh, how the the economic interests are involved and not remaining on this um, uh, cultural and attitude and individual level. Uh, and uh, there are many scholars who also write about this uh, how the proliferation of identities. Uh, um, can be understood within the needs of the flexibilized post for this capitalism. And so that it's not just assuming that every new identity deserves respect and uh, we can continue the list endlessly, but that we, we dare to, to look at it that actually the existence of list itself doesn't question <laughs> um, uh, global inequalities, doesn't cost anything uh, to anyone. Um, and it just um, um, 
it just it's of use to um, um, to uh, the global capital to window dressing, for instance. Uh, but uh, and then the two uh, points in the end where I am really more it, they are more questions than strong statements, uh, uh, but I believe they deserve at least a critical scrutiny first that uh, if we stepped in with our East Central European views then uh, as, a, as an intersection as a missing intersection <laughs> um, that uh, we look at it for ourselves or try to discuss it how current understandings of queer and intersectional uh, claims are embedded in their own contexts uh, and uh, cannot be copy paste uh, adopted everywhere else and uh, when it is uh, presented as such then it is a new universalism then it is a new form of western moral superiority uh, I remind of this uh, hashtag uh, banner from um, the Budapest um, um, March of, in, of intersectional feminists. Um, while at the same time, it's also, I think, uh, we need to critically engage with the, uh, over, with the overemphasizing of the positionality of knowledge, which uh, was a used to be a very important intervention uh, to see that what is presented as objective should also uh, um, uh, um, we should see that this is not uh, that it is a, a particular knowledge uh, that is uh, presented as universal while at the same time right now this is the right wing that uses it that we have a hungarian understanding of democracy this is our cultural uh, issue and everybody should respect our culture uh, so if we are giving up the universality then on which grounds uh, can we uh, say that their interpretations and their uh, position knowledges are worse. So I think we are having a, a challenge in this. That if if we are, if we stick to position knowledges, then we should be able also to see the intersectionalist queer um, struggles and feminisms as also position and being born out of their own context. Uh, um, or we are a universalist, uh, but then. Um, we cannot uh, say that we are so uh, interested in uh, positionalities. So I was, I think, a bit long. I'm sorry for uh, uh, this. I um, hope we will have a nice discussion in the next remaining minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Esther. I didn't want to jump in because I, I just really wanted you to finish uh, uh, all this uh, and especially uh, allow you to kind of really going back, uh, going to the conclusion. Um, I, I have a lot of, uh, uh, of thoughts on that, but there are already questions from the from the audience, so I will just jump right into those. Uh, so the first question is, um, how do you see the role of Central Europe in a process of colonization? Yeah, uh, it's a very big question. And I am sure that in the audience, maybe even the person who is asking is, uh, is more knowledgeable um, uh, about that. Um, I, I have a very limited historical knowledge on, uh, on how the Hungarian Austrian monarchy was involved in Asia or, or uh, um, I, I know there is a, a huge bunch of literature of how post-colonial framings can be used in post-socialist settings, but again, I think it's um, it needs to be contextualized uh, and uh, um, as you know, it's a very uh, out of context to you know like uh, that in Hungary or in Slovakia, someone should have a, a guilt towards. Uh, um, Africa, or you know, the, the, all this for this when when uh, when Europe is um, framed as a colonial power, then it is mostly Western Europe. So it's Belgium and the Netherlands and France uh, and Great Britain. What is meant? And Eastern Europe had a very different uh, position. And also there were countries that were at the same time um, colonized, or uh, and while being. Uh, 
evil to others. Like I you know about Hungary that we were in a not so happy union with the within the Austrian Hungarian monarchy, whereas uh, the Hungarian part had power over the Croatian part and the uh, Slovakian. And there, uh, there is a lot of uh, um, injustice done to uh, has been to Slovaks and uh, Croatians. So it's but it's um, I don't know enough to know if it's uh, if it fits the, this uh, uh, colonial understanding. But I, I think uh, we should be careful to just not use it um, uh, brainlessly for to different uh, contexts, which is maybe not colonization, but something else. But the, sure, there are these uh, historical injustices that needs to to be reflected, reflected on. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, well, uh, from a different, um, uh, from a different bag of uh, interest, I guess. Uh, it's uh, so in light of your critical remarks about the conceptualization of gender as a felt sense of identity. What's your opinion on the right to legal self determination, specifically in the case of trans people? I think it is a uh, um, uh, for adult people uh, that is a uh, that should be a, uh, an option and there shouldn't be discrimination and uh, everybody should uh, get all the assistance and help uh, that he or she needs. Um, but at the same time, and this is the controversial part of what I'm saying, I think uh, what uh, we can see in um, Great Britain, or what is now debated in Germany, that this um, that uh, puberty blockers and children uh, being uh, given hormones. I see it more uh, critically, and also the the idea that um, should be based on uh, uh, without psychological, psychiatric, um, um, medical advice so that it's um, 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 basically based on uh, self-ID. But but I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist and I'm not, uh, um, uh, I don't know enough about this, but it seems maybe less for trans people than for the non-binary uh, uh, that there is this offer uh, to young people and also coming from the through the internet and all those YouTube channels that the unease what everybody is feeling with uh, with expectations and with uh, puberty and with uh, our bodies and with uh, how others read our bodies and how they react on that, uh, that there is this offer on um, uh, interpretations um, that if you don't fit the rigid um, gender roles, like you are not a a, a pink, soft, uh, passive woman, or you are not a, a blue, dominant, strong man, then you are not a woman or a man. Uh, so that there is, uh, I think, more uh, critical discussion uh, needed. And uh, uh, and then very often, if people say they are non-binary, they just mean that they don't fit the, the very uh, narrow boxes, where in, in that sense, uh, all of us are uh, non-binary. So it's... Um, uh, I would uh, say that, yeah. Thank you. And um, another question from the audience. Um, thank you, Esther, so much. Uh, do you think there is a scope for the EU to address the inequalities, exploitation, such as class, gender, or regional inequalities, which it creates or sustains? Or is this out of the scope of, it, of its project, perhaps as fundamental ne fundamentally neoliberal project? I am very, very pessimistic uh, about this, unfortunately, but maybe it's um, because I, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I, I see the, I see too many hypocrisies and double standards. And um, uh, I know that there are people fighting for exactly the things uh, what were in the, question to addressing this, but the, the architecture of the EU is based, so it's, it's written in the functioning of, uh, uh, of it as an economic um, 
unit as an as a, and then it should be a beneficial uh, uh, economically so it's um, uh, very difficult to address things so for instance I, I am sure that it was well meant to address in the last 10 15 years more and more in economic terms so the issue of gender equality is addressed more and more in economic terms with that they wanted to sell gender equality that hey guys it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, dangerous it, it even even helps the economy it even boosts gdp so you shouldn't be afraid of that but you should encourage that but it it limits um the chances that what about the questions which are uh, not uh, boosting gdp there, there is a uh, it, it's not always possible to make a win-win situation. So the logic of care and the logic of profit making are, uh, you know, we see how uh, for years it's been blocked all the work-life balance initiatives on EU level from the governments that are strongly influenced by their industrial lobbies. So it is, uh, uh, I don't exclude that, it, it must be better uh, organized that um, um, or that the trade unions or that uh, more uh, socialists uh, come uh, there, but uh, that's a um, difficult endeavor. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> um, well, we, we don't have unfortunately much time, but uh, if there is no, I think no other question from the audience so far, I would like maybe like to ask you, uh, for, for me as a as a someone who is doing research on um, social movements in, in generally, I, uh, I I I I found I found very interesting how you uh, stress several times this um, idea of a copy paste um, activism and 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 you 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 are quite uh, critical towards social movements today I guess in 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 also how they cope or how they. Uh, uh, understand intersectionality, how they uh, use it as a, as a strategy or whatnot. But um, so I, I would like to ask you maybe from 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 a point of view, or maybe uh, on the on the case of Hungary, how you know uh, how how can we get over that? So if we, or or <laughs> of course yeah, I don't ask you to you know, to 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 come up with a formula uh, on how to. Do, do better activism work, but uh, <laughs> um, it's um, you know. Like for, so, for instance, when I'm thinking about the the case of of Poland, uh, I I don't know if uh, if if we can talk only about the copy paste activism, and I, and I think that uh, from what I've seen, what I found very interesting is how uh, activists today are coming together through different generations. So we have very young activists, uh, with those who were activists, let's say 1990, so they remember this uh, neoliberal uh, transition uh, and, and what happened with the, with the women's rights and but, uh, not just women's rights, but of course, so the, the, the economic uh, conditions that, that shaped our lives. And, uh, and I think that the like the notion of class has definitely uh, come into uh, into the um, uh, more in, into the narratives so that that our strategies or you know it's something that I, I do from what I've seen definitely uh, feminist movements are trying to come to terms with also as with this uh coming to the to terms with with our own history um we are talking much more about different feminisms uh, as opposed to one feminism um so um uh i don't know that that, that that's just my thought but maybe my the, the the question on you would be uh where do you see like the the biggest pitfalls or the, the danger of let's say uh, you know, co-opted intersectionality and how that mirrors in the social movement strategies. Yeah, you hope I didn't come through as a um, just a general critique of everything, uh, feminist or LGBT or uh, whatever. It's um, um, and I am aware that there are um, plenty of uh, different struggles, but what I see is very often the ones which are fought with intersectionality 
then they are not the most uh, system critical ones of, uh, as I said, of what I uh, mostly see uh, in my our contact and in our contracts, which is, um, it seems to be a context in more and more countries is that a very strong right wing turn. And then there is the other side. And then on the other side, everybody should be united. Uh, so it's a, another type of intersectionality in, in Hungary at the moment. It's uh, neoliberals, socialists, greens, uh, ex-Nazis uh, are one opposition. This is intersectionality, how, how uh, uh, we do it, but um, our rainbow uh, coalition. Uh, but I think uh, exactly the one of the things what you just said, that addressing class issues and uh, and so not adding up that let's be solidarity with the gays, let's be solidarity with the women, um, but that um, addressing the root causes also of the resistance against that. So it's not like explaining people not to be homophobic, but addressing why um, homophobic messages are so attractive to people. So going uh, one um, one level lower, uh, and I think this is what what I saw in Poland. But you surely know more about that. This uh, uh, alliances among or and with nurses or uh, women who fight for alimonies, like um, single mothers who fight for alimonies. Uh, so taking those struggles uh, seriously. In um, in Hungary, we had a very powerful, very very powerful movements of uh, women uh, fighting for against obstetric care. Um, women or mothers fighting for more state uh, subsidy, state help for, for mothers caring for uh, disabled children uh, who care for the child uh, every day, every hour, every night. Um, and they are not necessarily feminists. They don't participate in the strong online debates. Uh, they don't um, write articles, uh, but they, they provide really women to women um, um, help and they they managed to lobby and they even in the within the urban um urban regime so i for me this these are the very inspiring um uh, initiatives or the the movement of the nurses or the trade union movement so so not to just adding up all the human rights causes but that expanding the human rights causes with uh, housing poverty which we know that um, poor people and among them in many um, single parents, which are to 90% women with single children, they will be affected, but they don't frame it. Even the, those who are affected, they don't frame it as a woman's problem. But we know that uh, women are more affected. Uh, and even if men are helped by that, so what? So I'm... I'm um, more pragmatic in this that uh, very often we, we maybe just don't need to, to call it feminist. We don't need to call it with very fancy progressive uh, notions, just um, uh, making this kind of uh, alliances. And then when the, you know, the, the Hungarian government is now very much attacking academic freedom, and then the trade unions are coming and being solidary with the students uh, whose universities are now privatized and put under uh, state loyals, uh, then it would be conceivable and that uh, the same um, art students uh, get solidarity with the, um, uh, with the workers who are now dismissed around the pandemic and, uh, and don't or don't get paid for months or, or the state that doesn't help workers in any ways. So I, I, I would see the ways forward in this direction. Great, thank you so much, Esther. I I would have continued if it was up to me this conversation much further. It's been uh, really uh, a pleasure having you with us. Um, it it has not been in person, but uh, hopefully maybe next year we can we can all meet and and further discuss everything you just said and and maybe even more. Uh, it, it will be really really great great pleasure. So th thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for uh, inviting me. <laughs> Thank you. And for you guys who are watching uh, Facebook, don't forget that uh, uh, at uh, 6.30 there will be another event. It will be live podcast. Um, uh, 
sorry, uh, I don't know how to <laughs> translate this into English. We only Dabla and Kili, <laughs> uh, but all the information on our on our Strutani's, uh Facebook page. So uh, do 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 join us. And Esther, thank you so much again. Um, it's been really a pleasure, and uh, hopefully I'll see you soon <laughs> in another opportunity. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>